corruption in boxing making his long-awaited comeback. I hope everybody is well. At a time when the when a humanitarian crisis is in is engulfed pretty much the entire world, despite what the belligerent lies of the mainstream media is just propagating around the world. Young men and women in their 20s are losing their lives. But despite that, the consensus is that the coronavirus only affects the higher risk groups over 70. Now, you can see the good and bad in humanity simultaneously around the world. On the one hand, you have a deplorable, wretched animal in President Donald Trump, who is adamant to obtain the exclusive rights to a vaccine from private German pharmaceutical companies who are perhaps uh, leading uh, in their research and development of a vaccine probably by the end of the year. Donald Trump is adamant that the vaccine is not shared with or tabulated with Iran, Cuba, China, North Korea. I mean, that is, that is the moral compass of the most important president in the world at the moment. Now, if you look at Iran, the, the existing sanctions, specifically the OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, they prevent Iran from importing testing kits and face masks. That is the level of the, you know, the sanctions, the draconian measures and, and the pain and suffering that they inflict. I mean, Iranian citizens cannot even go online and uh, do a Google search. Google obviously being a US company to try and find out about what are the, uh, the symptoms and the best measures of preventing the contagion. Those search protocols are blocked. Um, so there is no friendship that is extended to such countries. Um, yeah. But anyway, you know, I wasn't here to, to talk a little, little too much about politics, which I definitely want to do, but I'll do for a different day. I want to talk some boxing. Now, I want to try and um, You know, when a lot of you, when a lot of people are in self-isolation now, you know, the schedule has been desecrated. Not only boxing, but global sporting events. Um, a lot of people are just a fiend for for sports, but um, you know, maybe it's time to you know pick up a book and start doing some reading or listen to some music, etc, you know, spend some time with your families, do some home improvements, anything, you know, but anyway, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about boxing, and uh, we know that great fighters of the past, one fighter in particular, that um, Salvador Sanchez, who a fantastic fighter from Mexico who sadly passed away in, I think it was in 1982, at the uh, tender age of 23. But in those 44 victories, 46 fights, only one defeat, had uh, managed to defeat Hall of Fame fighters in. Benitez and Azuma Nelson and um, 
the unanswered questions of how much better or did we see the best of of Sanchez? It's a a difficult question to answer, given that he, you know, he had forty six fights, but a decade before that, um, there was also another fighter who also tragically died at the age of twenty three. And the similarities are very startling. Um, Oba Masao was born in Tokyo, Japan, uh, in October, on October the twenty-first, in nineteen forty-nine, and um, he sadly passed away on the twenty-fourth of January, um, just a few weeks after his last fight. In, in 1973, um, also at the uh, very, very sad and tender age of 23, um, Oba was, you know, enjoying life in the new Corvette and um, made the mistake as a, a, a lot of people in sports cars. Um, Venturing, you know, 60 in Tokyo on a 30 miles per hour road. Lost control. I think he was on his way back to Tekken headquarters where, you know, he was living and training out of um, lost control and, uh, you know, was killed pretty much instantaneously. Um, But I can definitely say that, you know, Oba was definitely a fighter that we didn't see the best of. Now, Oba made his um, his professional debut in November on November the seventh in nineteen sixty six at the age of seventeen. So his professional career only spanned seven years, and he was a fighter who was getting better and better, and was potentially going to move up. Now he remained he remained throughout his career at flyweight. Um, now he's been dubbed as um, as the eternal champion because Oba never lost his world championship and was never defeated whilst making four defense of his WBA flyweight championship. Now Oba's style of fighting. Now he was a tall flyweight. Um, he was around five feet five and a half inches so for that specific weight category it is definitely tall but he was a he he was the the vision of perpetual motion a father who was never stationary super aggressive father who was a range, I wouldn't even call him a boxer, he was a fighter. But he could box, but it was about distance for him. Very athletic in his style, he never used a conventional high guard. He was about evading punches, using his athletic ability to slip punches, taking steps backwards, and then expl- and then an explosive arsenal, he he would consistently be in front of walking down fighters, but never smothering his punches, very rarely engaged in a clinch, holding, etc. His style was extremely draining, not only for the fighters who he fought against, but for himself as well. I never saw Oba Masao take more than six seconds off, even in a round, let alone fighters. We see 15 round fights taking rounds off. I've never seen Oba take a round off. I've seen the majority of his fights. Now, Oba was very skillful, aggressive elegance, and we talk about fighters who have magnificent jabs. Now, Oba was, for me, one of the best jabs I've ever seen. 
a jab that he now he would use the jab 40 50 times during the fight but during the course of whether it's early in his career four rounders or 10 rounders or 15 round championship fights he would use the jab differently at different stages of the fight early on he would be probing he'd throw consecutive jabs three four and then moving semicircle to his right so he would structure his attacks against the orthodox fighters from from the left so his jab would position fighters back into the back into his right hand where he, where he would explode with overhand rights right crosses then fighters would come back you know try and Obel would then step out of position with his quick feet and before fighters knew what was going to happen he would explode into range with you know vicious straight right hands um not really a body puncher either, um, but his jab was was a method of not only controlling distance, but it was a very unsettling punch, an unsettling weapon for his opponents. Who it was just a nuisance in their face. He Oba would not even allow them to regain any any recuperation time whatsoever. So Oberstahl was not only physically demanding on not only himself but his opponents, but the mental pe- pressure he would exert, but not even giving fighters the opportunity to even think about changing their strategy or even take a breather by utilising their own jabs. He would just be on you. A very, very decent fighter in terms of the feints he would adopt at, at sort of at range long range mid range constantly fainting but then he would explode sometimes not even using his jab but straight right hands now it was explosive combination punching two-handed attacks very quick hands tremendous footwork not only to get into range quickly but also to slip punches as well, get back into range, move side to side on the spot. Um, Really exciting, super aggressive style. Um, Yeah, he he was in there not only to, he was out there to inflict damage, but never in a malicious way. You never saw any, 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 low blows or elbows or headbutts like that he he wanted to maintain range so th- those sort of dirty tactics only really come into force when a fighter is perhaps on the inside or is so far behind in the fight that he wants you know if you if you remember a fighter liam smith against um liam williams in the uk um at 154 pounds Uh, Liam Smith, the champion at the time, was getting systematically outboxed, had lost all eight rounds. And then in the ninth round, he launched a deliberate, vicious headbutt that literally split Liam Williams, um, his eyelid. And uh, Liam Williams' corner, you know, made a mistake rather than allowing the the referee to stop the fight. Uh, But, you know, that's a corner thinking about the safety of their fighter and uh, you know they stopped the fight but but that's what I'm talking about Oba was not would not ad- adopt those sort of tactics you know there is a, a level of sportsmanship that you know Japanese fighters adhere to and it, Oba would always touch gloves even with fierce fighters that he was fighting with at the end of every round when there was wars going on so, you know, just a, a, a magnificent fighter and a great sportsman as well. Now, in such a short seven-year career, um, a, a career that was, as I remarked, was tragically cut short. Um, however, Ober had already amassed pretty much a Hall of Fame career and he was inducted in the Hall of Fame in, in 2014. And um, 
in that seven year career um, Ober had a you know amassed you know a number of you know excellent victories against a, a lot of fighters that perhaps a lot of world have not even heard of but um, now he had wins over um, Burkrek uh, Chartvanchai from from Thailand he was the formula WBA flyweight champion superb fighter as well very very slick um, also against uh, Susumu Hanagata now that, that that's a another great fighter from Japan former WBA champion as well who had actually beaten Oba Masao early on in their careers when they had a 10 round fight in Tokyo um, it was a, a very close fight only a couple of couple of points in it here and there no substantial damage inflicted by either fighter but uh, you know Hamagata um, um, Hanagata um, after Oba's death tragic death uh, uh, Hanagata um, won the WBA flyweight championship and he he lost his final fight whilst champion against the girl the great Mexican Miguel Canto but uh, Ober had actually uh, avenge that defeat they fought later on when both of them were in their prime and um, when when over was the uh, WBA champion um, so uh, Hanagata and another very unknown great champion from Japan um, he was their ninth uh, flyweight champion um, um, now Uh, Oba had also had also beaten um, um, let's have a look. He uh, Rocky Garcia, who was a you know an excellent fighter, um, but perhaps the most notable win of his career was against um, Batulio Gonzalez, the um, the Venezuelan. Um, Flyweight who had finished with you know 76 uh, victories, including 52 knockouts. Uh, he was a a free a free time flyweight champion. Um, extremely tough, rugged, heavy-handed, clever puncher um, who was involved in you know great trilogies against the great Mexican Miguel Canto and. Um, he also fought um, another brilliant trilogy with a, with another great two-time um, WBC flyweight champion, um, uh, Sh uh, Shoji Oguno. Um, you know, an excellent fighter. And w when you watch the um, the, the Oba Masao and the Batulio Gonzalez fight. The fight took place in, in Tokyo, Japan. It was um, Oba's first defense of the WBA Flyweight Championship. Really, a, a 15 round fight, tremendous fight. Um, but it was Oba's, it was his speed, it was his hand speed, it was his relentless attacks. Um, he never really gave um, Batulio Gonzalez the opportunity to actually come forward, sit down on his punches. Um, Oba would, he was the ring general, he would dictate where the fight was taking place. You know, early on he was just probing him, knocking him off balance with his jab. Two, three, four consecutive jabs. You know, great one twos coming back. He would jab to the body as well. That was one of his, you know, favorite attacks as well. But as the heart, the fight started heating up in 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 the mid to late rounds, um, 
Gonzalez came back and uh, there was times and some of the only times in which uh, Oba was actually pushed back onto the back foot. Um, now Gonzalez was a you know a phenomenal puncher. You know, 50, 52 knockouts in 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 seventy six you know victories. That, you know, at only sort of five feet and a half. So that that will sort of you know emphasise the power that he had in his in his in his left hook and his right hand as well. Um, the the later mid rounds, you know, they were just exchanging vicious punches, but over his hand speed and his relentless two fisted attacks, you know, got the better of you know Gonzalez, and um, it was a you know really a fantastic fight, and a, you know a, 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 that was a signature victory, and. Um, in his in in his in over you know that was his that was his first uh, WBA flyweight championship def- defense. Now Ober had four defenses, and in his last fight in in January 1973, he got floored forty seconds into the first round. Now because he's a fighter who used his lead hand so much, it was probably he. Either that or his right hand, right cross, etc. was these formidable sort of punches. Um, you know, his left hand would be low. He's not using a high guard to block punches. So he was open to, you know, counter right hands and right hooks in particular when he's actually coming forward. And it was a right hook that floored him. It was a flash knockdown, but Ober fell. It was a precarious landing. He went over on his ankle and... Um, I think he had actually had uh, ligament damage um, because he was out of the ring for over four months after that. And um, he was limping for pretty much the entire fight. But he managed to, you know, overcome adversity. Now, when a fighter doesn't have his feet, and Ober in particular, because as I mentioned, his legs were his first line of defence in conjunction with his upper body movement but uh, when you're able to overcome you know a disadvantage of that sort of magnitude you know up against a you know a former world champion as well and um, finish off your opponent um by using, you know, very well calibrated, stru- you know, attacks, where he had to get his, where he had to get into, he he would almost use decoy punches to, to almost force the fighters to come to him, and then use his explosive hands. So it was a real, it it, you know, it really did sort of, you know, emphasize that, you know. The cleverness that he had in his boxing, um, not only to using using your your feet to get into into punching range and keeping that distance, but for a lot of for a lot of a lot of the fight, he couldn't he couldn't do that. So he was he he had to make the adjustments against the opponents who were using. Um, who were using not only their aggressive nature, but they were using, you know, their feet to almost dictate the fight. So, in the end, um, you know, Oba was able to land, you know, it was overhand rights, consecutive overhand rights, and eventually, you know, it led to a knockout. Um, quite a, quite a fitting sort of epilogue to what proved to be, uh, you know, his last fight as you know, three or four weeks after that you know he he lost his life in a car crash now what the world was denied was a potential unified championship fight with his old 
nemesis, um, Batulia Gonzalez, who had who had won the WBC flyweight championship in '73. So another fight between them two for the unified championship would have been fantastic, whether in Japan or in Venezuela. Um, there were, you know, other fights. Um, Oba could have um, could have fought, um, you know, two-time WBC champion Shoji Uguma. Um, that would have been a massive, a massive fight in Japan. You know, two great flyweights fighting. Um, there was also a possibility of fighting, you know, Miguel Cantor as well, the great Mexican. Um, but from from the research that I've I, that I undertook, I, um, I think the f- a fight with um, Batulia was was his first option but I think um, Ober also expressed you know strong desires about moving up in weight to try and c- capture the um, the bantamweight world championship um, you know he was pretty big at the weight at five five feet five and a half just short of five feet six and um, he was um, only 23 so he'd, he was developing getting better and better um, and obviously putting on a lot more strength as well. So who knows at, at you know at bantamweight, perhaps a fight down the line with one of the greatest punches in history, you know Carlos Zarate of Mexico, who who won the WBC bantamweight a few years after that, you know in '76. So Oba probably would have made his bantamweight debut in around maybe late 74 so it is a possibility that the two of them could have met you know at some stage or perhaps you know for I, I guess it wouldn't have been a non-title fight it wouldn't have been a voluntary it probably would have been for the championship but and um if people don't know about Zarate um Zarate along with his Mexican fellow Mexican uh, Ruben Oliveres are the only two boxers in the history of the sport to have two separate streaks of 20 or more consecutive knockout victories in a row. Um, you know, Zarate was the former Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year and um, considered as one of the, you know, the most formidable pound for pound punches in, in the history of boxing just a phenomenal fighter along with Oliveris as well um, Oliveris who, who had lost to the great you know Alexis Arguello who was also a, one of the greatest punches in, in history as well so um, yeah what would have happened in with Ober and uh, Zarate um, I think it would have been a competitive fight Oba had already showed against you know Batulio Gonzalez that he was able to neutralize the power of his opponent, the greater power by his his boxing IQ. You know, he wouldn't. Batulio d- didn't have the hand speed, nor did he have the footwork. So Oba was able to neutralize uh, you know Batulio for large sort of stages of the fight. Uh, you know, against Zarate, who was a, you know, a far more of a formidable sort of puncher. Um, I think speed would have been the key for me. Ober's speed, his footwork, keeping the fight at range, forcing uh, Zarate, a puncher, to keep, forcing him to keep turning, not allowing him to set up his punches. I think that would have been his strategy, but you know, anything could have happened in those fights, but it's, um, yeah, 
one of those fights that I've you know thought a, thought a lot about you know try and sort of in your head prognosticate what would have happened you know a very good you know debate topic with with you know some some of the great channels out there that like to talk about fights like this you know um, so Marcel Oba the eternal champion finished with a record of 35 wins two defeats one draw 16 by knockout was the WBA flyweight champion never defeated as a champion never stopped his first defeat was only a four round fight in Japan so that's pretty insignificant you know um, his other defeat as I mentioned was to Hamagata another great great flyweight champion who Oba subsequently avenged as well uh, but Hamagata went on to win the championship after that so it shows how good he was only losing to in the end to Miguel Canto in his very last fight as the champion so he is one of the great fighters from boxing history that you know not talked about a lot in 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 western boxing fraternities but Oba Masao the eternal champion we salute you um, corruption boxing hope you enjoyed that historical aspect um, sayonara